Okay. Okay, welcome everyone. I am Michelle Carter. We are at the Aram Public Library today, both face-to-face -face and virtually with local author, Rebecca McLafferty. Rebecca is going to be talking about her journey as an author, and she is also going to be sharing her current book, Intentional Errors, and her upcoming book, Intentional Fires. Rebecca began writing um, in high school, and she's going to share her journey with us. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box, and um, we'll get to those at the end of the program. So take it away, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Michelle. I want to thank Michelle for the introduction and for hosting this event um, without her and the board of directors and the city behind us, this wouldn't be possible. So I owe my thanks to you. And uh, I'd like to start out by looking at that first slide. And that's a picture of my husband and I. And I had to include him in the slide because I would not be the author I am without his support. So I give him that. Um, all of my life, I've loved the country, and as you will hear from me, um, much of my background is from the country. So we will go to the next slide here. And Michelle already mentioned about uh, questions and comments, and I do say please jot down any anything that comes to your mind because I love interacting with people, and I'm always eager to hear what you ha have to say or ask. So my family history, my mother comes from a very small uh, community in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Both of my parents were from the Upper Peninsula. Um, you can see from the little map there, the red is, on top is Canada. And I hail from near Sault Ste. Marie, which adjoint is right next to Canada there. So um, my mom's community was called Dollar Settlement. It's now considered a ghost town in Michigan. And I still have residents there, so um, relatives. So I guess I have ghosts as relatives, I'm not sure. Anyway, my father uh, is from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan also, Sault Ste. Marie. His father was editor of the local newspaper there. So I like to think that that kind of rubbed off into my genes and, and uh, my Father did graduate from high school, which my mother did not. So again, we, we have that there. Um, my uncle, my mother's brother, um, had his own farm as he got older. And he would not own a plow, one of those dirty, stinky old machines. He blacksmithed on Mackinac Island. And when he farmed, he farmed with his little horses which were Belgian draft horses, uh, beautiful. So my love of horses kind of stemmed from that between him and my grandfather. So Upper Peninsula, Michigan, uh, small, smaller towns, that's kind of my history. So influences as, as I got older, my parents owned uh, two different businesses. Uh, first came a small lake, a resort in mid-state Michigan. Um, times were kind of tough there for them. And they were very serious, business-minded folks. Eventually owned a 12-unit motel in St. John's, Michigan, which is downstate near Lansing. Now that, as you can guess, is quite a culture change there. Um, went from a classroom of 200 to about 44. So um, I can appreciate the difference in large communities and small. And I like to use that in my writing also. So um, met my husband. We were married in 1973. He was stationed at uh, Kinchlow Air Force Base in the Upper Peninsula. Um, he, we just celebrated our 48th anniversary. And a lot of those early years, were military. He was in the Air Force, uh, first at Kinchlow in Michigan, and then a year later to Ramstein Air Base in Germany. And we learned a lot, me especially, I guess, about military life 
Um, he worked the bases as military. I worked the bases as a civilian employee. So we um, moved to Ramstein after three years. After that, to Phoenix, Arizona, near Phoenix, Williams Air Force Base. His last, my husband's last tour, as you can see from that map, was in the Aleutian Islands, the third island from Russia. And as you can see above that, he's kind of close to Siberia. So you can only imagine what the weather was like. And I'll let you guess what they were doing that close to uh, Russia, but it lends to good story material. So military life, just like this picture here, we are in Austria. Um, we got to see places, do a lot of fun things, went on a lot of trips. Uh, Paris was one of our favorite spots. We were there numerous times. The first trip uh, we spent, we got into Paris late at night, hailed a cab to take us to the USO so we could get a motel room. Um, went on a crazy taxi ride through Paris, up and down, zigzagging the streets, just like you would see in a chase scene on a television movie. He finally let us out at a motel. We walked inside, slept, got up the next morning, opened the blinds, and there was the USO, kitty corner across the street from us. So when you're in a foreign country, they have opinions of foreigners just as you do. So very interesting uh, story material. Family is really important to me, to us. Um, again, you see my husband and myself there in the upper left. Uh, below us on the left is our son, Sean, and his wife. Um, our son passed away in, in 2010, so she remarried, and her wonderful husband is next to them there with our granddaughter, who live out east near Washington, D.C. in Virginia. So that part of our family, so, so special. On the upper right, our daughter in the middle, uh, dark hair, and her family at present, and this was the family in 2017, with two young children, we as they adopted Bachelie and Ruth and Milo James from Haiti. And going through that process gave us a great feel for not only the adoption process, but you know, the, the changes, the adapting. No talk about a major language barrier and food barrier and everything else. So, you know, family is cherished and we learn from each other constantly from day to day. So, and as long as I'm showing pictures of everybody, this is my little Tessa Marie. And she is an Aussie doodle. We've owned a lot of dogs over the years, ranging from a 150 pound Newfoundland to a 15 pound Lhasa Apso. So this is Tessa Marie. And I wanted you to see her because in my next book, you will meet an Aussie doodle. So that will be part of that. We bought a farm. Not we bought the farm, but we bought a farm. <laughs> and as you can see many years ago, it needed a lot of TLC. So that became our dream farm. It evolved into this picture. Um, a lot of, lot of years, a lot of hard work, um, complete with a store and conference room. Thank you to my husband for his building expertise. Um, along with the farm, came crops. And you can see my prized sunflowers, uh, my very favorite flower, and how tall they grew. And we live in Wisconsin, and now every other house seems to have sunflowers by them, but they're still my favorite nonetheless. And you might see a sunflower or two mentioned in a story. So uh, another, just a quick shot, granddaughter enjoying the flower leaves. So that apples and more. We grew a lot of apples and other produce and that allowed me to or gave me the idea to go through the state and obtain a state certified uh, licensing permit so that I could make jams, preserves, all these things um, and sell them at our local, excuse me, our store in the farm and other places. 
So again, this is all part of the entrepreneurial journey that many of my um, heroines, heroes will experience. I really have a soft spot for trying to run your own business. So you can see that there. In addition to apples, we grew crops. And this is a picture of one of our first years uh, with soybeans. And you can see me getting into it with my John Deere t-shirt and um, you know, fitting into the, that picture. My life experience, you know, I'm from a farming background, but I wasn't a farmer by any means. And my respect for all of the farming community, anyone that deals with crops or land, you just have my greatest respect. Here's our first alpacas. We had a lot of animals on the farm uh, and probably the most unusual were our alpacas, which are a big part of my book, Intentional Heirs. Um, Arctic Autumn, her daughter Maya, the Pinto, and the little boy Lance along just for the fun of it all. Our first babies here are called Kriyas. Uh, that's a baby alpaca. And like any baby, you fall in love at first sight. And uh, we, we just marvel at them. And they're definitely in my novel. So interactions with people were such fun on the farm. Uh, we loved inviting uh, school trips, field days. Uh, we had a lot of events that were open to the public. And at first, the alpacas were leery of the people and the people were leery of the alpacas. But after a little bit of coaxing, when you're holding a bucket of food, they come right up to you. So it was a fun experience for everyone. And mm, that is an alpaca speaking, especially when you've got a mama around her new Kriya, her baby. They go, hmm, hmm, and you hear that all the time. And also, this alpaca was our very first logo. So part of the business. They also are voracious eaters, and they love hay and grass. And this dark alpaca is little Miss Roscoe, who I never could take a picture of without hay sticking out of her mouth. So we have a little bit in common. She loved to munch, too. Shearing alpacas was another very fun thing to do. Here's our daughter helping out. It was, it involved everybody and was a long day from beginning to end. Um, in the process of shearing, we ended up with mountains of garbage bags full of fiber that we had made uh, into rugs, alpaca rugs, and there'll be a picture of them a little later. So that was another part of the, the business scheme as it unraveled. Um, my husband thought that turkeys were pets, and he liked to pet them, uh, regardless of the fact that one was 35 pounds, that turkey. Um, <laughs> so we didn't all share his enthusiasm for how friendly they were, but he managed to be friendly with them that showed me any animal is approachable, or most any, if you know what you're doing. So again, animals always have a part in my books. Um, we had a hen that wasn't a hen, uh, got a batch of little chicks in and this one started growing and he became dark black and he went doodle doo all the time and he turned out to be quite a rooster. He strutted around. Uh, he had dark blue feathers in with his black. He was very beautiful, but he got a little mean and a little aggressive and Pretty soon, he was chasing me out of the pen, trying to. So I would always hold a Frisbee and give him a little boink on the nose and say, you know, shoo, shoo. And pretty soon, it was time for chicken stew for dinner. <laughs> we got rid of our rooster. We had barn cats. And I have to tell you, I grew up, I was not a cat person at all. And um, we had mice in our barn and we needed cats. So we adopted these two from young kittens and we became inseparable. I would call the dog and the cats would come running. And I learned that what I didn't know could be quite amazing. So they were, they were our little barn cats, Mickey and Billy. And then I had a store. I always wanted a bookstore and my husband built a store in the front corner 
of the barn and I had books in a corner of it, but I had a lot of other things too. We had 22 vendors. And as you can see, they made everything, <clears throat> excuse me, from candles, um, just all kinds of things here. The, in the next one, you can see some soaps. It was incredible what they could make. And it really taught me about what they went through to sell their wares and how they interacted with people. Again, the entrepreneurial spirit that was part of everything, well, marketing, special events, contests, holiday events. I mean, it, it was all part of it. And I love the people. People were the greatest. Um, gelling and selling. Yeah, that was what I did. Um, created our own labels, a lot of merchandising going on. And that follows right through to selling books and having a website and all those things I did back then, which became part of what I do now. Um, we sold a lot of alpaca products. And if you can see me, here's a scarf. One, you can see one in the picture there too. And um, yeah, we had a lot of alpaca products for sale and candles. Um, people made those bags that were hanging there for sale and you can see maple syrup and you can see honey. And I have such a passion for these people that know how to do so much. And I, that's why I love to write about them. Um, you know, if you were doing these things, what would you be doing? Christmas corner in my barn, in my store. It went up all year long. I would just keep adding different things to it. Um, it was my way to remember Christmas all year long and also uh, remind people, hey, it's time to gift shop. I turned Christmas music on in the middle of the summer and, and everybody loved it. So that was a great part of the farm that I really enjoyed was my Christmas corner. We rented facilities and here you can see a um, baby shower going on. That room that they're in was the main room in what became uh, my, my writer's room for writer's conferences that I ended up holding. So we have, whoops, held, excuse me, a lot of, uh-oh, go back, go back, go back. We held a lot of um, different events. You can see um, a writer, a, a luncheon meeting going on on the left. On the right side was a drum circle. So we experienced a lot of unique things that I never knew about. And that just opened my eyes to the world of possibilities. Um, my first Christian Writers Conference is here. Um, we didn't have the conference room yet, and we used big tents. And as you can see, um, people were just, they had such fun. And it was so great interacting with seasoned authors and presenters that knew so much. I mean, I learned just as much, if not more, than they did. I had the privilege of emceeing the event. But I just loved it. And that was dangerous for me because when I held a, a, a microphone for the first time, I realized that I really liked it. So, so it was a dangerous situation. Really loved it. And we've had other events. Um, a church group um, approached us and they wondered if they could have a nativity set done on our farm. So they came in with cameras, they recorded it, um, all the people, parents, cameras. I felt like I was on a TV set and it was, it was great fun and another aspect of marketing and dealing with the public and just loved it. It was, it was really great. Um, on the farm, we planted something like 425 little Christmas trees. As you can see, they grew. And we learned a lot about running a Christmas tree farm. And it comes as no surprise to you then that in this next book that I am currently finishing up, the main uh, heroine is trying to make her Christmas tree, her family Christmas tree farm, trying to get it to survive. Uh, there's a lot of obstacles going on, but as you can see, you know, with Christmas tree farms, all these things, 
my husband used to tell me, write what you know. And I used to get a little frustrated because I thought I can research anything and write about it. And I could to an extent, but I found that the more I knew about different things, I could write with more authenticity. So just like Christmas trees, uh, we had a lot of events on the farm to raise awareness about particular causes. Um, we did fundraisers for things. Um, it really helped me to know what the public was going to stand behind and what some people could be outspoken against. And again, that is great story material for, for me. It really helped me learn a lot, you know, holding these events. Um, just a little tidbit on the farm. You have to have a playground when you have children involved. And being that my husband was in parks and recreation for 30 years, he became a valuable resource as well. Um, not only could we build a playground, but he knew about vandalism and all of the public issues of what was where and who was doing things to different areas. And that, as you will also notice, is very prevalent in my story writing. Our motto then was helping people create memories. And you see that Country Memories Farm, that was our, our sign uh, that my husband was given when he retired. And we still have that sign today, although we do not live at the farm anymore. That's still an intricate part of our life. And that sign is mounted on our back deck, as a matter of fact. So some things never go out of style. So reading, writing, and retirement. And there's me with a whole bunch of fish and Snoopy, I'm a huge Snoopy fan. So you can see that I've got Snoopy and Woodstock in their fishing as well. Um, what a great way to fulfill a dream is to be able to retire and write. What I dreamt of doing all those years. But if you can mow it, but if you don't do it, you know, action does speak louder than words. I had to know my resources in all regards. And firsthand experience was so important to me through what I had done and what I'm continuing to do. Um, I have to focus my dreams, uh, what I really want to do, and I have to stay focused. One way for me was I felt that I needed to continue my education. Um, I had an associate degree but I wanted to major in creative writing so that I could hone my craft, make it better. Uh, I wanted to be able to relate to people as, you know, as good as I possibly could um, to write with confidence and authority, but I really needed those skills. So I am taking classes. Um, actually, I just finished the creative introduction to creative writing class. And it was the most fun class I've ever taken in all the college classes that I've had. So writing in various genres of fiction, devotions, poetry, self-help. Um, I wanted to be as good as I possibly can be, you know, when I'm actually writing. Um, Country Memories. If you'll remember, it started out as Country Memories Farm, LLC. And in 2020, we changed it to Country Memories, LLC. We still have the focus on um, country and the memories, but the farm, since we're not living on the farm anymore, we, we took that out of there. We really wanted to continue uh, having an LLC for business reasons. Um, if any of you are authors out there or whether you have a business or not, it's really important to protect yourself. And we found this out. Uh, we, we want financially to keep ourselves separated uh, from our own personal assets and business assets. The first um, LLC that we had, we went through a lawyer, had it all done properly. Um, the second time around, we did it ourselves online. And if you have a basic knowledge of it, it really is fairly simple to do online. It commits us to our 
the professionalism of our business and people take you more serious. They know that it's not just a hobby when you have an LLC. So you will see our new logo, the C and the M for country memories. The wheat is still a symbol of our country, even though it's a little colorized now, kind of pretty, I think. Um, but the wheat is also a symbol of country. It's also a symbol uh, to me uh, is bread or the bread of life, which is Jesus. And I do have, uh, we have a Christian background and that is all part of our business. So I'm really pleased with our new logo and we have a website and products for sale. So running the business. Um, Intentional Heirs is actually the third book I've written. Um, you can see a picture of it there. And it was my pride and joy when it came out. Uh, I love the, the cover that was designed. And actually the people on the cover, the, the lady was my own uh, choice when I sent photographs to my designer. This was one and the mountains and and she did it just like I hoped she would. It was great. Um, my first two books, I say, were practice books. Uh, I grew in my writing as I went along. But this is a Christian romantic suspense novel. It's staged in a town near Livingston, a fiction town. And I will get to that later. Uh, it's a clean written book. Uh, book one of the Sun rise crick series crick is not creek misspelled crick is a very small creek and they do use that word in montana too so so it, it's authentic um, book one of the sunrise crick series um, here you will see us in montana it was the way that i could do my own authentic research uh, write what you know and so here you see us sitting in front of what was acclaimed to be the best in the West, serving beef, buffalo, and elk hamburgers. So when I was sitting in this restaurant, I, I knew that I was in Montana. Um, you know, it was very authentic, good food too. I will say, I won't tell you which burgers we had, but it was really good. We enjoyed the scenery behind us, as you can see there. We also took in the sights. Um, you can see on the left, uh, people photographing the huge Buffalo uh, Roundup. We were there for the annual Buffalo Roundup um, in uh, Custer National Park. And they had lots of wranglers on hand to talk to the people. And it really gave me the feel for being, you know, in Montana, their history, uh, which is traditional but the history that they're so proud of and live, it lives on today. Um, my husband fished the Yellowstone River and it was just like being in a picture. Um, as you can see, I was not fishing in the picture. I was doing what was suggested and that was taking pictures and watching for bear while he was fishing because bear have been known to come up behind people when they were fishing. So. That was part of that story. Um, while we were fishing, we were there for a good while and we could see the clouds coming in. And I had heard that Montana was prone to quick storms and it came in fast with lightning shooting down. And needless to say, that ended my husband's fishing in a big hurry. Uh, the line came out of the water. We didn't want to be electrocuted. So we hurried back to the car and uh, got away from that, but it was all experiences that I could relate to Montana because we lived it, we were there. And uh, writing a book, oh my goodness, there's so much to consider. What genre do you wanna write? Do you wanna write suspense? Do you wanna write romance, um, horror, science fiction? What is it? Um, what do you want to write about? And those are all things that I had to consider um, before I wrote my first book. But one of the most fun parts of writing a book is creating your characters, especially your main ones. Uh, you have to decide what kind of personalities they're going to have. Um, I created a goal, motivation, and conflict chart. 
um, completed questions about them. I'm going to show you. Here's a here's a slide with a sample of a question and answer chart for main characters, because you need to know everything about them that you can come up with possibly, because you don't know what's going to come up in the story. Um, you you think, okay, I need to know their hair color, the color of their eyes, where do they live, uh, what do they like, what don't they like. But there's so much more to this. You need to know, they hear gunshots. What are they going to do? Are they going to drop to the ground? Are they going to, you know, what, what are they going to do? Um, how do they feel about certain circumstances? Are they optimistic or pessimistic? Um, when they're put in a situation, you want to know, as a writer, how they're going to react. But the fun part of that is when you're writing about them in a situation, they may have a mind of their own and act a completely different way than what you ever suspected. And that's, that's when you know that you're really getting into character and it takes off. So you need to know a lot of things. You can Google um, character charts and there's probably hundreds of them out there or you can get one and then add your own questions to it. But the more you know about your character, the deeper you can get into their personalities. As I talked about genres, the main ones you can see are mystery, thriller, uh, science fiction, romance, fantasy, but look at all of the ones in between. There are some genres just ranging from, there I am down in the bottom, uh, purple romantic suspense, up to legal thrillers and espionage or um, steampunk or cyberpunk. I mean, it's, you want to know what your genre is because you want to know that what you write is going to find a market. And if you're writing something unique, that's all right. But you have to realize that it's probably going to be a little more difficult to find a home for what you're writing than if you can say, Yes, I've written a traditional, uh, even fantasy or a you know, historical romance, whatever you write, you know, you've got to figure that out first. So my biggest asset, my biggest tool in writing is Michael Hogg's six stage plot structure. Without this tool, I could not write a book. I have to know that at 10% in the story, 25%, 50%, certain things have to happen throughout your story to make it come out right. And this is not true just for books. This is for a movie as well. Um, you have to know that you've got this much time invested in order to get your story as deep as you want. Um, it's fun to do this at a movie theater, but you don't wanna spend, I, I did this actually, I, I sat there timing things to find out what was gonna happen a quarter of the way through and halfway through and It can make you a little bit of an irritating partner to sit with when you're looking at your watch constantly. So I would, I would advise doing that at home, but it is fun to do and to realize that your, you know, your book has to follow a certain structure. This is my um, intentional errors plot structure. You, can, you can't read it very well, but I will tell you that everything happened at the stage where it needed to. And you had to keep deepening that plot, deepening that plot, because you would realize, you know, okay, you're making like stage three, you're making progress. Stage four, you see complications and higher stakes. You had to do more, build more. This is one of my very favorite slides. There's a saying in novel writing, Make something bad happen to your protagonist, your hero, and then make it worse and build suspense in your story and then make it worse. So if you see me sitting behind the computer half in tears because I'm doing these awful things, making my life, their, the life miserable of my hero or heroine, then I know that I'm attached. And that's a very good thing because it's hopefully getting the reader attached too. But that's me sitting behind the computer, literally, you know, I, I'm practically, you know, hiding my eyes because I don't want to know. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm doing this to you. Um, 
There are 16 different personality types, according to Meyer Briggs type indicator. To me, they are the authority on personalities. Um, I make sure that my main characters have a specific um, personality type. And for each one of these personality types, you can get pages of information on what they like and don't like. Uh, a short example of that would be a policeman, the duty fulfiller. So he's going to be, um, you'll see he's serious, quiet. Um, he's extremely thorough. He's very responsible and dependable like you think a policeman would be. Um, powers of concentration fully developed. You know, when he gets thinking about something, he's not gonna let it go lightly. Um, supporting and promoting uh, traditional things, usually quite patriotic, well-organized, hardworking. This just gives you an idea of one personality and they can all get so deep uh, into thought. There's Here's other personalities. And as I said, you can, if you have a general knowledge of the character, if you want this to be a, the life of the party person or the guardian, the caregiver, you can kind of, tell from some of the titles, um, you know, what they are. The initials are all coded according to introvert, extrovert, um, you know, they have their own. But if you go into the, as it says here on the first one, the Meyer Briggs type indicator, you can actually find out your own personality in addition to that of your characters. So um, it's something very, very useful and it's a lot of fun, makes your characterization a lot deeper, you know, for your characters. Another really fun thing of making a story is creating your story world. And depending on where your story is going to be located in the mountains or, you know, big city, is it gonna be Chicago, New York, or is it gonna be a small rural community? Um, I find a map that I can use relatively. I'll run the map off. This is what my, I want my town layout to be. Then I'll rename all of the streets. As you can see here, I've put a big nature trail and park into my story. That's a very big part of intentional airs. Um, added a lake in there. Um, really fun. So this is Woodridge, Wisconsin, or Arizona, excuse me, Arizona, Montana. You've had me all over the map here. This is Woodridge, Montana where my story takes place. And it's very critical. You can see, um, well, I don't know if you can make it out, but star, there's a star by number 20. That's the police department. So I have to make sure that every time he comes out of the police department, he turns the correct way. He, uh, to get to uh, the main parts of town, he's gonna turn right or left. And I refer to this map constantly to make sure because if I write suddenly I'm going the other direction, somebody is going to let me know that one of my readers is gonna say, hey, you're in the wrong part of town here, or you named it road here and it was street there. So it helps you to be consistent and it's just really fun. My next book in the, in the series is Intentional Fires. I don't have a cover for it yet. Um, it is set in the same, place in Montana in the Woodridge area. So you'll see familiar faces and you'll see some new faces. There's a lot of fiery scenes, both externally and uh, internally, a lot of action. So just to give you a heads up on that. Um, a book that I've already written other than fiction is my devotion, uh, Devotions for Country Living. Prayer in which fields, in which fields you'll see there. So they were 50 devotions that I wrote up that they're about a page and a half each directed to all who really love country living. You know, there, it's especially um, touches on fields, prayer enriched fields. But anybody that loves country life, you know, would be able to appreciate these little like early morning devotions or just when you need a little perk up sometimes. So that's available as you can see there on uh, amazon.com, Kindle Unlimited. So how to get published. 
I could I could do a whole speech on this, but just to say there's not one best way. Traditionally, you find an agent who will support you and take care of all the rest, but that's not so easily to happen these days. Even if you find an agent, you're going to probably be doing a lot of this yourself. So many of us self-publish. Um, there's classes on it, books on it. Um, if you actually go to amazon.com, not that you want to publish, but Kindle Direct Publishing has a lot of great tutorials on there that will tell you about, you know, give you advice on doing this or that. And you can kind of feel out whether that's something you want to do or not. So just little tidbits there. Living my dreams, that's what I'm doing. Um, you can see the bottom part of my author page there. Um, Shine is so his influence never ends. That's my little logo there. Um, putting in the time and energy to do it is living my dream, being able to live my dream. You know, you get, you do the email. I've got blog posts that I do. Um, I contribute weekly to fill my cup, Lord. Um, get yourself out there to do it. And every little part you have is just another little angle. It's like spidering off of, of the main, you know, web, if you want to create that as such. Why write? Because it fulfills my dreams. And I learned so much about myself doing it and other people and other people's lives. And oh, it's very fulfilling. Um, when I was growing up, I read. And as you can see by this, a lot of young girls read the Nancy Drew. Oh, they're as popular today, I think, I'm assuming as they were uh, back then. Michelle will be able to tell us that. But, um, you know, whether you, you know, here's Black Storm, Timber Trail Riders, they all had uh, animals in them or youth conflicts against each other. Um, what authors influenced me? I'm, this picture is a little dark, but I wanted to show you it was the billboard um, at American Christian Fiction Writers Conference in 2010. I had the privilege of hearing Jeanette Oak speak. And she was the first uh, Christian fiction author I had ever read. I can't, I just couldn't believe how real to life her characters were. And it just set the stage for how I loved, you know, meeting authors. Here I am with, with um, Susan Marlene down here in the bottom, right? You're watching Sue. And in the, in the uh, middle there is Patty Smith Hall. Uh, she writes a lot of regular um, full length novels, as well as she ha has written for uh, Love Inspired extensively. So going to a conference, here I am at American Christian Fiction Writers, um, honing your trade, learning more, um, keeping in touch and just always growing. You know, why do I write? Why do I make my characters go through what they do? Um, it's never enough. Just keep going, keep growing yourself and your writing. Uh, writing resources are a lot. These are some of my favorites. Um, characters for, uh, careers for characters. Uh, Diane Mills is uh, the dance of character and plot. K.M. Wyland, I'm a big fan of her self-help, you know, how to, and she's got workbooks and and the regular books, of course, that go with them. Uh, Sarah Grosskopf recently put out uh, The Only Four Historical Fiction Mistakes. And she is just a wonderful um, historical fiction writer as well. You would wonder that a simple book on baby names can be research material, and it is. When you're looking for names for your characters, what better way to pick out names and I always have to know the meaning behind my names. I don't want somebody named Tinkerbell Bell to be a, a first villain, unless that's part of the draw of the whole thing. So uh, creating character arcs, I always want my characters to go through the story growing and end the story completely different than what they started. So, that's really the most of what I have to say here, um, unless there's any questions or answers for anybody. Before I do that, 
I want to again thank Michelle for allowing this to happen so we could be here with everybody and uh, just really enjoy the presentation. Such a privilege. Thank you, Michelle. You are very welcome. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, we'll take a few minutes for questions. If anybody has some, um, you can just unmute your microphones or if you'd rather chat, you can do that too. And we got about five minutes for questions. I have a question. Um, several people couldn't make it tonight. And um, Sarah, actually, you know, she uh, hurt her back. So, you know, keep her in prayer. Yeah, but um, she was wondering if there's a way to be able to listen to this in the future and where to go to do it. Um, where that be? I can answer that for you, Susan. So the session was recorded and we'll be posting it on our Facebook channel, but it'll end up on our YouTube as well. Awesome. So the Aram, the Aram Public Library YouTube. And when we post it, I'll send it to Rebecca and then anybody who registered tonight will also get it. Awesome. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Um, when is your next book maybe due to come out, you know, for book two? <laughs> yes, I'm looking, I'm looking towards the end of the year for that okay. to happen. Um, nice. It takes a while yet to get cover designed and all. And I'm, I'm just still making life miserable for some of my characters. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have to do my best at that, but yes, I'm eagerly anticipating it. Um, can't wait for it to get out. I already have stories in mind to, for after that. So yeah, another couple months. So I'm gonna switch the slide one more. Mm -hmm. Forgot to put that on there. That was my support my library. That's the Aram Public Library right, right there. <laughs> Do you have another devotion book coming out? Um, I've started on one. I don't have a title for it yet, but I will tell you that it's also country related. Awesome. <laughs> I will say that my, my mother-in-law, she's in the hospital right now and she received your book. You know, um, thank you for sending that out to her. Mm -hmm. And she just so enjoyed it. And she told me she was so tickled pink by the ending. She just <laughs> has a smile in her voice which was really great because she's really had a rough time lately and you've really cheered her up. So wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, I appreciate hearing that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Make sure and tell her that I said, thank you. <laughs> oh, I will. I'll call her tomorrow, you know, but uh, yeah, I really enjoyed your talk. You know, I, I just really enjoyed seeing how you um, create your book and how you come ac across uh, resources and, and things like that. Cause I think thank that's you. so useful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One thing I didn't say was that when I went through such a myriad of different jobs, I mean, working for, you know, law offices, I work, worked for a small town police department, um, you know, whether I worked for city manager or city lawyer, all these different things, but we moved around a lot too in the military. And, and I kept thinking, oh, why can't I just have a job like everybody else? I can work 20 years, 25 years, you know, in the same place. But I realized there were, was a reason behind that because now I have a lot of background to use in my writing. So that's a good point. All right. So I'm going to um, stop the recording now.